Howdy folks! Today we'll be talking about platelet physiology and pharmacology. Before we begin, let's take a look at our agenda. First, we'll be talking about an overview of platelet function. Then, we'll talk about the molecular pathways of platelet activation. Then we'll end our discussion today by talking about platelet pharmacology and relevant drugs that you should know. Let's start by talking about an overview of platelet function. Here, we have a damaged blood vessel. Let me orient you to some of the geography. Here, you have indiv individual endothelial cells that are lining the blood vessel. Notice how there, we have a bunch of cells here, and then a break, and then a bunch of cells here. This is meant to represent endothelial damage. The idea is that whether it be due to trauma or hypertension or some sort of damaging force, the cells in the middle died and kind of went away, and they exposed this subendothelial collagen that we have here painted in orange. Uh, now the idea is that platelets are sort of the first responders to any sort of vascular damage. The idea is that if there's damage, platelets will, platelets will come first and form a platelet plug, and then afterwards there will be a full fibrin clot form. So platelets are sort of the first parts of the broader process of hemostasis. Now here we have a platelet depicted. Now the platelet can't directly bind to this collagen initially. It has to bind through a molecule called von Willebrand factor, or DWF as I'll call it for short. Now, BWF is secreted from damaged endothelial cells in response to the injury that we mentioned earlier. The endothelial cells will release BWF, and it will travel and bind to the collagen. So we have one end of the BWF bound to the collagen. The other side of the BWF will bind to the platelet through the GP1B receptor, as depicted here in black. And this receptor is actually a complex, it has a more complicated name, we'll call it GP1B for short. So the platelet binds to VWF through the GP1B receptor. And this function allows the platelet to be adhered to the subendothelial collagen. Therefore, we call the step platelet adhesion. Once the platelet is adhered, it's then going to undergo activation, as depicted in this step. This platelet activation consists of two broad changes in general. The first change is in shape. Notice how the platelet here is drawn in a round shape, and here it has kind of spike-like projections coming off. This shape change is very important to help facilitate uh, platelet aggregation with other platelets. Secondly, you'll notice here how we have the GP2B3 receptors drawn in an inactive form. As the platelet gets activated, these receptors will become straightened out and allow them to bind with a, a new function. So the idea is that once the platelet adheres, it then sends a tr signal transduction cascade that lets it get activated. And this activation will allow for shape change and for the activation of receptors that promote activation, or aggregation, sorry. So, we'll be talking about a little bit later the nuances and the specific pathways of activation, but just know that in response to this adhesion, it will then trigger this activation step. Now notice here, we also have a molecule called tissue factor. Tissue factor is a protein that's found in the subendothelial collagen, and will actually set off the coagulation cascade, which will eventually create thrombin. Now even though thrombin is a key player in the coagulation cascade, it also can cross over to this pathway and help activate platelets. So even though we talk about platelet plug formation and then coagulation as though they're completely stepwise, that's not quite the case. There actually is sort of crosstalk between these pathways. They aren't mutually exclusive in how they happen. So now that we have platelet activation, the next step is platelet aggregation. So now that these platelets have activated GP2B3 receptors, as depicted in red here, they're actually able to then connect with other platelets, either through VWF or through fibrinogen as depicted in orange. So we have a platelet here, we have the GP2B3 receptor, the linking molecule, whether it be VWF or fibrinogen, and then the other receptor, and then the platelet itself. And this allows the platelets to aggregate and form a full platelet plug. Now over time, as the coagulation cascade happens, recall that the fibrinogen will actually get broken down into fibrin, and the fibrin plot will get formed. So as you form more and more of your tough fibrin plot, you'll progressively break down some of the platelet plug to provide some of the fibrin for that plot. So just to summarize, platelet form plug formation happens in three broad steps. We have platelet adhesion to the collagen via VWF. We have platelet activation that creates shape change and activation of the GP2B3 receptors. And finally, we have aggregation where platelets connect together via either VWF or fibrinogen, and they're connected through those GP2B3A receptors. Now, two quick points before we move on to the next section, 
where we discuss the specific mechanisms of activation. There are two diseases you should know about that involve plant receptors. Uh, if a patient has a mutation in GP1B, it could be due to, due to the Bernard Soulier, which is a disease where the GP1B is mutated and no longer functional. So the platelets are normal in quantity, but they're qualitatively different and have impaired function. The other disease you should know is a mutation in GP2B3A, which is called Glanzmann's thrombastenia, which is basically a mutation in this receptor, which also affects platelet function. So both of these are examples of qualitative platelet disorders. The total number of platelets will be fine, but they'll still be impaired in their function, so patients will have symptoms related uh, to thrombocytopenia. So now we're going to move on to the specific mechanisms of platelet activation. Here, we have a platelet drawn by this orange outline. And in this outline, we have various signaling molecules and signal transduction pathways outlined. Before we begin, I want to make clear the color scheme. All the pathways drawn in blue are going to inhibit platelet activation, whereas all the pathways drawn in magenta are going to activate platelets. So blue is inhibitory, magenta is activating. Now we have two signaling molecules here that are going to promote the inhibition of platelets. They're going to inhibit platelet activation. These are PGI2, also called prostacyclin, and adenosine. And both of these molecules are going to act through GS-GPCR signaling to make cyclic AMP. And cyclic AMP is going to be the key player here in inhibiting platelets. So once these molecules are bind to their receptors, they're going to trigger the GS signaling cascade. What that means is that the alpha subunit of these receptors is going to activate the enzyme adenyl cyclase. This enzyme is going to convert ATP into cyclic AMP, and then cyclic AMP will go on to inhibit calcium release and thereby decrease, or rather inhibit, uh, platelet activation. So these two molecules are going to eventually make more CAM and inhibit platelets. Now what's important to note is that PGI2, or prostacyclin, is secreted by healthy endothelial cells to normally inhibit platelet function. The rationale is that in a normal blood vessel, uh, there shouldn't be clotting. So healthy endothelial cells will secrete prostacyclin on a normal basis to stop the platelets from getting activated accidentally. However, when there's damage to endothelial cells, and when you probably need platelets to actually get activated, you will have a decrease in prostacyclin, and thereby you'll kind of release the inhibitor, so to speak. And adenosine is actually a metabolite that's produced from an ADP that we'll talk about later on. Now what's really important to note is that adenosine is going to inhibit platelet activation, whereas ADP is going to promote platelet activation. Adenosine and ADP sound very similar, and are chemically similar, but they have opposite effects. Recall that ADP is basically adenosine with those two phosphate groups added to it, but that makes all the world of difference with respect to these pathways. Just wanted to be very clear about that. So PGI2 and adenosine are going to inhibit platelet activation via this GS signaling. So now, let's talk about the various molecules that promote platelet activation. Here we have three molecules and signaling pathways drawn out. ADP, thrombin, and TXA2, or thromboxin A2. Let's talk about thrombin and TXA2 first. Both of these molecules are going to act through GQ-GPCR signaling. What that means is that when these molecules bind to their receptors, they're going to activate the enzyme PLC, or phospholipase C, drawn here. This enzyme is going to cleave the molecule PIP2, which is a phospholipid found in, in platelet membranes. It'll cleave that molecule into DAG and IP3. Now, DAG is then going to activate the enzyme PKC, and this is going to lead to granule secretion, which I'll talk about in a minute. Now, going back to the IP3, this is going to travel to the endoplasmic reticulum, and it's going to promote calcium release. Now, when this calcium that leaves into the cytosol, it's then going to also promote granule secretion, but it's also going to uh, activate the enzyme myosin light chain kinase, or MLCK, and this is going to promote shape change in the platelets. This shape change is really important because normally platelets are round. They basically have to add on these little spike things in order for them to basically kind of click together better, kind of like these fingers interlocking here. It's really important for their ability to aggregate together and form a platelet plug. Now, with respect to this granule secretion, uh, in response to all these signal pathways, platelets will, platelets will secrete granules that include molecules like ADP and thrombin, things that will help promote activation. The idea is that these platelets will release these molecules, and then they'll bind to that platelet itself in an autocrine fashion, 
or they'll bind to nearby platelets in a paracrine fashion to help promote their activation. So it's kind of like a positive feedback loop. These things that activate platelets will promote the release of those same things that also promote activation. So it's a positive feedback loop. So that's how thrombin and thromboxin A2 promote platelet activation. Now let's also talk about ADP, which is actually released by one of these granules here. ADP is going to bind to a GIGPCR. Now this is going to have two effects. Number one, the GIGPCRs pretty much always oppose the actions of GSGPCRs, they're kind of in uh, opposing forces. So it's going to inhibit the enzyme adenylate cyclase. So it's going to decrease CAMP. And as we said before, CAMP is going to pre prevent calcium release into the cytosol. So by decreasing adenylate cyclase activity and decreasing CAMP, it's going to promote calcium release from the endoplasmic particulate. In addition to this effect, by directly opposing the, the GS pathway, it's also going to lead to the action of thromboxane A2. So let's travel over here with the dotted line. It's going to activate the enzyme PLA2, phospholipase A2, which is going to produce a arachidonic acid from the phospholipids here, kind of similar to PLC. So now that we have arachidonic acid, this, through a series of steps, will get converted into thromboxane A2. One of the most important steps in this process is facilitated by the enzyme cyclooxygenase 1 and COX, or COX1, and this enzyme is going to be very important for discussing pharmacology. So to summarize, ADP is going to promote platelet activation by inhibiting cyclic AMP production and by increasing thromboxin H levels. And as we mentioned earlier, thromboxin A2 is then going to leave the cell, or the platelet rather, and bind to the GQ receptor and also promote activation in a positive feedback loop. So now, let's talk about platelet pharmacology. Many of the drugs that we're discussing inhibit platelet activation and therefore can be used in a wide variety of conditions in which you want to decrease the chances of a blood clot. Let's first start talking about PDE3 inhibitors. Dipyridamol and salazazole inhibit the enzyme PDE3 or phosphodiesterase 3. Recall that this enzyme breaks down CAMP into AMP. Now recall that CAMP is going to inhibit platelets by keeping calcium stuck in the ER and not letting it go into the cytosol. Therefore, molecules that inhibit PDE3 are going to increase CAMP levels and thereby inhibit platelets. Therefore, dipyridamol and salazazole promote platelet inhibition, which is good for stopping blood clots. These drugs in particular can be used in treatment of peripheral artery disease, but they can also be used in other conditions as well, where you want to decrease blood clots. Now let's take a look at clopidogrel. Clopidogrel is an ADP receptor blocker. Normally, ADP is going to bind to its receptor and promote platelet activation. Thereby, by blocking this receptor, it's going to promote platelet inhibition by blocking the activator. Similarly, vorapaxar is a thrombin receptor inhibitor. By blocking the thrombin receptor, thrombin cannot bind and induce its activating effects. Therefore, vorapaxar is going to be a platelet inhibitor. Now let's take a look at aspirin. Now aspirin is a really common drug that a lot of folks have heard about. At low doses, aspirin is primarily an irreversible COX-1 inhibitor. Now this COX-1 enzyme is involved in the conversion of arachidonic acid into thromboxin A2. So by blocking COX-1, you're going to be making less thromboxin A2. Recall that thromboxin A2 actually binds to one of these receptors and promotes platelet activation. Therefore, in a similar manner to all of these, by blocking this enzyme and blocking TXA2 production, you're going to promote platelet inhibition. So I want to end our discussion today by talking about a drug side effect. So far, we've talked about drugs that inhibit platelet activation and are used in the treatment of diseases that involve blood clots. Now, I want to talk about the side effect of a drug that's not related to this platelet stuff. So let's talk about salicoxib, which is a COX-2 selective inhibitor. Now, so salicoxib is going to inhibit the COX-2 enzyme, which is used to convert arachidonic acid into PGI-2 or prostacyclin. Recall that this process happens in endothelial cells. So the endothelial cells are going to convert arachidonic acid into PGI-2 and send that molecule to the platelets to promote platelet inhibition in a healthy state. Now, salicoxib is going to block COX-2 and prevent those endothelial cells from producing prostacyclin and sending it to platelets. Now, because you're preventing the production of prostacyclin, you're decreasing the inhibition of platelets. Therefore, by decreasing the inhibitor, you're promoting platelet activation. Therefore, one of the side effects of COX-2 selective inhibitors, like salicoxib, are adverse cardiovascular events. Because you're inhibiting this inhibitor, so you're promoting platelet activation in a sense. So I hope you enjoyed this video today. 
Uh, a big shout out to our videographer and scribe, Peter Shea. If you like this video, please like and subscribe, and let me know if you have any thoughts in the comments. Thanks and have a great day.